it's Mr. Murphy. We are continuing our AP exam review by talking about the Industrial Revolution in Unit 5. And uh, certainly Unit 5 is a unit of revolutions, as we've talked about. So we've talked about the emergence of new ideas with the Enlightenment and some of the uh, political revolutions and the ideas of nationalism that we saw. But just as there were new ideas forming during this uh, time period, and again, we're talking uh, 1750 to 1900. Uh, we also have new technologies that are really reshaping societies. And these technologies led to uh, changes in society and economics and the way that humans interact with the environment. And all of these changes are a part of the Industrial uh, Revolution. So before we kind of get into some of the aspects of the Industrial Revolution as we look through this, uh, we'll start with kind of an, an overview of, of where things began. So just before the Industrial Revolution in the early 1700s, an agricultural revolution actually uh, emerged. And remember, uh, this is different, obviously, from the Neolithic Revolution, when uh, the uh, discovery of agriculture and its innovations allowed for civilizations to, to form as people settled in one place and built societies uh, based on subsistence farming. Uh, in the early 1700s, this agricultural revolution increased productivity. Uh, part of the reason for that is the emergence of crop rotation, uh, which is rotating different crops in and out of the field each year to uh, save the nutrients. And we saw a little bit of that with the manor system, right? So some of these things were not completely brand new. You also had the seed drill as another innovation during this time, which was a device that um, efficiently places seeds in a designated spot on the ground uh, to increase food production and the efficiency of land usage. Um, also, you have the introduction of the potato from South America as a result of the Colombian exchange, which uh, increased the caloric intake that people could, uh, could have. A, a quick and, and large amount of calories could come from the potato, similar to like uh, the advances in champa rice uh, we saw in Asia. And as nations industrialized, uh, their populations grew, partly because more food was available to more people. And we also see improvements in medical care, infant mortality rates, uh, and um, uh, infant mortality rates uh, improved, meaning they declined, and then life expectancy increased. So with these demographic changes, more people were available to work in factories, and provide a market for manufactured goods, and again, uh, reside in cities because uh, materials were more accessible uh, to individuals. Now, there were technolo uh, technological changes, obviously. I mean, that's the kind of the uh, crux of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, during the, uh, the early 18th century, the early 1700s, before the Industrial Revolution, most British families lived in rural areas. Uh, they grew most of their food, made most of their own clothes. Uh, for centuries, wool and flax uh, were raised domestically. Uh, people spun fabrics as needed in their homes. But one result of the commercial revolution and the establishment of maritime empires that we talked about in the previous unit, in unit four, was that Indian cotton became available in Britain. Uh, and soon it was just in high demand. Uh, wool and flax could not be produced quickly enough or in large enough quantities to compete with the cotton coming in from India. Um, so to compete with the Indian cotton, investors in Britain began to build their own cotton cloth industry. So they used imported raw cotton produced by slave labor in the Americas and developed a cottage industry system that was also known as something called the putting out system in which merchants provided raw cotton to women who then spun and, and uh, finished it into cloth in their own home. So that it was this, that's why we call it a cottage industry. And that was kind of the early groundwork for the industrial revolution. So before we have large textile factories in Great Britain, we have these cottage industries. Home spinning was hard work paid low, uh, but cottage industries gave women weavers some degree of independence. Um, 
while working in their own homes, they also had to focus on, you know, child rearing responsibilities. But the problem with cottage industry production is it was slow and investors wanted faster production in order to compete with these um, other merchants. And that's what motivated this development of technologies and machinery to turn out cloth much more quickly. So by the mid 18th century, when you have the Industrial Revolution coming into focus, the spinning jenny and the water frame reduced the time needed to spin yarn and weave cloth. Uh, the spinning jenny was uh, invented by a man named uh, James Hargreaves in the 19, uh, 1760s, and it allowed the weaver to spin uh, more than one thread at a time. So think about how much more efficient that would be. And then the water uh, frame uh, used water power uh, to drive the spinning wheel instead of manually. So that was more efficient than relying on a single person's labor. And this is a, an example of the mechanization that we will see in the factory system that will come to define the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in 1798, Eli Whitney introduced, um, created a system of interchangeable parts uh, for manufacturing firearms in the United States military. And in Whitney, who's probably more known for the cotton gin, which also impacted, increased the output of cotton from the United States. But the interchangeable parts system uh, worked where if a particular component of a machine were to break, then the broken component could easily be replaced rather than needing uh, to replace the whole new machine. So entrepreneurs adapted this method of making firearms to the manufacture of other products. And, and this really contributes to the uh, industrial technology we see during this, this era. And by having uh, separate parts, uh, having a machine consist of separate parts, it leads directly to this division of labor that defines the industrial period. Factory owners no longer had to rely on skilled laborers to craft every component of a product. So instead, you had this specialization of labor where each worker could focus on one task or one part of a product. And so uh, Henry Ford expands this concept in the early uh, 1900s to the um, moving assembly line. Uh, and he used that to, of course, manufacture the Model T automobiles. And then, of course, you have the advent of the uh, steam engine, uh, which revolutionizes transportation. It also revolutionizes the type of, of resources we're extracting uh, from uh, the natural resources that we're using, in particular coal, uh, because a steam engine was powered by steam. And to get that steam, coal was used to heat water. And then this also uh, stemming, from, uh, stemming from the use of these types of natural resources, we have an increased reliance on iron, which is uh, another defining component of the um, another defining component of the of the industrial revolution, because uh, coal made that possible and made the mass production of iron possible throughout the 1700s, and the early 1800s. Uh, Iron producers were able to increase their outputs because they improved uh, the production process, such as the introduction of coke, which is a refined form of coal um, that allowed uh, iron producers to use much larger uh, furnaces. Cast iron was strong but brittle, uh, which made it difficult to shape and stretch. But by 1794, an Englishman by the name of Henry Court patented the process for making the less strong but more workable wrought iron, which was more versatile in industrial production. And probably uh, for our context is more, uh, most uh, recognizable in the form of uh, fencing, uh, wrought iron fencing. Now, this uh, Britain was uniquely positioned to become a leader in the Industrial Revolution, and it was a lot of it was just kind of um, uh, being in the right time, uh, being in the right place at the right time. Uh, Britain had many environmental and geographic advantages just from its location. It was located on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, many seaways, 
uh, is well placed to import raw materials and then export finished goods. Britain also had the geographic luck of being located uh, on top of immense coal deposits. And as we just mentioned, coal was vital uh, to industrialization, to power the fossil, uh, to power the steam engine, and then also in the production of iron. So coal mining became the major industry of northern and western Britain, including South Wales, Yorkshire, uh, Lancashire. And um, when the United States industrialized, coal mining areas um, also developed in Appalachia, particularly West Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania. Uh, as a colonizing power, also, Britain had the um, access to resources in the North American colonies. Uh, this included timber for ships, uh, and largely because of the wealth they accumulated during the transatlantic slave trade, uh, enough British capitalists had excess capital or money available to invest in businesses. And so with this capital, private entrepreneurs um, created new commercial ventures and companies. Uh, Britain also had abundant rivers. Uh, they, um, uh, and same with the northeastern United States, uh, and these were sub, uh, were strengthened by publicly funded canals and harbors, and they made the transport of raw materials and finished products relatively inexpensive. Britain also had, as we've mentioned, the world's strongest fleet of, of ships by far, uh, including naval ships that could defend. Um, trading routes. They had commercial ships that could be used for trade. And these ships brought agricultural products to Britain to be used to make finished products that could then be shipped out to consumers. Another vital factor that helped Britain uh, in terms of industrialization was the legal protection of private property. So entrepreneurs needed the assurance that the business they created and built up would not be taken away. Uh, either by other business people or by the government. Uh, and not all nations had this legal protection of private property. And we see a lot of that built into common law in the United States. Um, the increases in agricultural production that I talked about earlier also caused some shifts in society in Britain in particular. So as farmers grew more food, they could support more people. And as they grew up more efficiently, society needed a smaller percentage of the population to actually be farmers. We've seen that before. So this growing population in rural areas did not stay in rural areas because they didn't need to. So migration to English towns uh, became a common trend during this time. And you had something called the enclosure movement uh, as the government fenced off uh, commons areas to give exclusive use of it to people who paid for the privilege and who purchased land. And as a result of that, uh, many farmers became landless and destitute. So they had no choice uh, but to force small farm or to, to move to these urban areas. And it forced small farmers away from the rural areas to these urban areas like Manchester and Liverpool. And they became part of this growing, uh, growing workforce and contributed to the urbanization of Great uh, Britain. And, and we see this trend repeated in other areas uh, of the world. So moving on to the spread of industrialization, um, of course, Britain, as we said, is kind of the leader in this. Um, and like uh, Britain, uh, we had countries like France and Germany uh, and the United States who uh, possessed capital, they possessed natural resources, they had water for tr transportation. Uh, but despite some of these favorable factors, France really had sparsely populated urban centers, uh, which limited the amount of labor available for factory production. Uh, then you had the French Revolution from 1789 to 1799 that really um, um, consumed its attention and um, the money, uh, the capital of French uh, elites, uh, not, not to mention the Napoleonic Wars that will follow shortly after the French Revolution. So this kind of delays the Industrial Revolution that happens in France. Germany, as we talked about um, during the first uh, Unit 5 review, was uh, politically fragmented in these smaller states. Uh, and then it was after they unified in 1871 that they were able to focus their energy and effort on industrialization. 
the United States uh, began its industrial um, revolution uh, in this same time period in the 19th century. And by 1900, actually, the United States was the leading industrial force, certainly uh, in uh, the world, uh, coming off of its um, the U.S. Civil War, where you had government support of um, industry, basically adopting a laissez-faire approach to uh, capitalists who were investing capital in uh, railroads and the factory system, particularly in the North. Uh, and human capital, the workforce in the United States, was the key factor uh, to its success. Um, Political upheaval um, and widespread poverty uh, in uh, Europe and uh, particularly East Europe and East Asia brought a large number of immigrants to the United States, uh, which again, this is a continuity because these immigrants, as well as migrants from rural areas, provided labor to work in the factories. Chinese immigrants uh, were uh, played in, uh, an instrumental role in the expansion of the transcontinental railroad in the United States. Russia began to industrialize as well, uh, focusing, speaking of railroads, primarily on railroads and exports. Uh, by 1900, Russia had about 36,000 miles, believe it or not, of railways um, that connected its commercial and industrial areas. Trans-Siberian Railroad, probably the most famous of which because it took, it took us from Moscow to the Pacific Ocean. Um, this opened up Russia to trade with uh, uh, China and Japan. Uh, Russian coal, iron, steel industries um, were strengthened as a result of the railroad. Um, and then actually by 1900, Russia was the fourth uh, leading producer of steel in the world. Um, however, uh, a lot of this was forced, as we've talked about before. They Russia kind of tried to fast forward industrialization. So much of the economy uh, really remained agricultural until uh, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Japan was the first country in Asia to industrialize. And uh, it was really probably the, the country that had had the least contact, the Asian country that had the least contact with Europe since the 17th century. Um, by the mid 19th century, Japan went through what's called defensive modernization. So basically, Japan said, look, uh, if you can't beat them, join them. So we need to industrialize and adopt some of these technologies and techniques before the Europeans come and try to impose them on us, because that way we can at least do it in the image of Japan and we can protect our traditional culture. And, um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit more about how that plays out in Japan when we look at some illustrative examples. So we do have changes and shifts in manufacturing. So uh, this, while Middle Eastern and Asian countries did continue to produce manufactured goods, their share in global manufacturing overall declined. So this sees, and this is gonna be a trend that we'll see continue, this shift from the East to the West. Uh, shipbuilding, as we talked when we talked about maritime trade, shipbuilding initially saw an increase in India uh, at the end of the 17th century, partly due to the um, political alliances that had been formed between India and some of the uh, European and Western countries. But Indian shipbuilding ultimately suffered as a result of just Britain's mismanagement of resources and ineffective leadership during colonization. Uh, in fact, in 1830, Britain designated ships of the Briti uh, British East India Company as the Indian Navy. And then the Indian Navy, though, was disbanded by 1863. And then the British Royal Navy took complete control of the Indian Ocean. Um, so basically just a complete subjugation. Uh, British colonial rule in India also impacted its mineral production. Um, during the period of company rule, uh, that's when the British East India Company controlled much of India from you know the 1750s to the 1850s, so for a hundred years, uh, steep British uh, tariffs led to the decline in India's ability to mine and uh, work metals. And the British also began to close mines completely, uh, especially after the uh, rebellion of 1857, because they perceived that the mines were being used 
to um, extract lead for ammunition that then was being used in rebellions against the British uh, colonizers. So Britain was scared. They were afraid of another um, uprising in India. So they passed something called the Arms Act of 1878. And that restricted not only access to minerals, but also to um, just producing firearms in general. Uh, they limited ability, India's abilities uh, to um, uh, mine in mineral-rich areas, forcing them off the land, and most of the mines were essentially abandoned, uh, and the mining industry was all but extinct in India. Uh, and even uh, when uh, uh, British royal uh, rule in India ended in 1948, mining and metalworking uh, remained really non-existent until probably the early, uh, the early uh, 20th century. So the lack of, of technological innovation after so many years of abandoned mines um, led essentially to a crude labor-intensive method of mining that was a step behind the rest of, of the world. India and Egypt were also among the first to engage, as I mentioned, in the production of trade and, and textiles, particularly cotton. Um, and just like what they did with iron and, and other metals, uh, British colonization limited uh, British um, or Indian textile production. Uh, so the, uh, a flourishing textile industry in India undermined the British textile mills in Britain, uh, which were coming, which were getting cotton from the slave labor in the Americas. So the British government imposed an equal, a quote unquote equalizing 5% tax on all textiles produced at more than 80 mills that operated in India, which basically uh, undermine their profitability and their ability to compete in the global market. Likewise, Egypt's textile industry faced some of the same um, uh, consequences and, um, you know, uh, the huge growth in European textile production basically led Europe, e India and Egypt both to lose its, uh, their markets, um, uh, their, their access to the global markets. Then we have um, the what's often termed the second industrial revolution, um, and the key players in this really was the uh, were the United States, Great Britain, and Germany, uh, and this occurred in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century. So, uh, first industrial revolution, you know, we're talking seventeen fifties to eighteen fifties. Um, second industrial revolution, we're talking eighteen fifties to uh, the early nineteen hundreds. Um, the first industrial revolution is defined by textiles, steam, pot, steam power, and iron. Uh, the second industrial revolution is known for steel, for chemicals, for precision machinery, and electronics. So the mass production of steel, uh, which is a, a, a mix of iron and carbon, became possible with the introduction of something called the Bessemer process in 1856. Uh, basically, it involved blast. It involves blasting molten metal with air to remove impurities and then keep the metal from solidifying. And um, over time, this has really been been refined to make still really the backbone of industry even to this day. Uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, we also had the our first commercial oil wells uh, drilled. Uh, petroleum, like coal, is a fossil fuel. It's an energy source. Um, and at first, the most important product from petroleum was kerosene, which was used for lighting, uh, for lighting and for heaters. And then uh, by 1847, inventors were able to find chemical techniques to extract kerosene from petroleum. And this also led to the development of precision machinery and then the internal combustion engine, which in turn, uh, which in turn leads to the automobile airplane technologies, and uh, some of the other more recognizable uh, inventions that we can see affecting our world even to this day. Uh, we also had uh, electrical power, which uh, with the um, development of an effective electrical generator uh, by 1882 in London, you had the first public um, power station uh, that began production. 
and electrification led to street lighting and electric street uh, trains in it by the 1890s. Indoor lighting also allowed the factory system to really flourish because now you could work literally around the clock. Uh, the development of electro electricity and electronics over the years also led to developments in communication technology. So inventors had been thinking and trying to find ways of transmitting sound by electrical means since the early 19th century. And Alexander Graham Bell was able to secure a patent for the telephone in 1876. And so early phone systems, though, uh, were obviously low in quality, but it was still revolutionary. And in 1886, Thomas Jeff, uh, Thomas, not Jefferson, Thomas Edison introduced a design that refined the voice uh, transmitter to make the telephone a more reliable means of communication. Uh, you also had radio uh, emerging uh, with um, uh, Marconi playing a leading role in that. And in 1901, Marconi was able to send and receive radio signals across the Atlantic Ocean. And that became a form of popular mass media, uh, unlike any that we had previously seen. And then, of course, you have with uh, the railroad, steamships, and the telegraph, uh, partly stemming from Marconi's uh, developments, that made exploration, development, and communication possible. The telegraph allowed almost immediate communication. Uh, construction of railroads like the Transcontinental Railroad in the United States, which I mentioned, facilitated U.S. industrial growth. Um, the desire for capital was a driving force in, in increasing trade and this notion of accumulation of wealth. Um, so whereas earlier trade and migration often centered on coastal cities, uh, railroads, steamships, the telegraph opened up uh, to exploration and development the interior regions around the globe. Um, so, and that's, we saw that the development of the interior United States. So access to these areas increased trade and migration. Let's continue on with the government's role in industrialization. So as Western domination and technology spread, um, they met with varying degrees of acceptance in different uh, nation states. So each country uh, experienced competing pressures between those who wanted to preserve traditional values and then those who wanted to modernize. And at the end of the day, the pressure to modernize and industrialize uh, ultimately uh, won out, although it played out in different ways in different areas. Um, in some of our illustrative examples here, the Ottoman Empire, even though it bordered Europe, did not um, adopt Western technology um, or Enlightenment ideas by the time the Industrial Revolution started. Uh, moreover, you know, uh, you had uh, rampant corruption, which led to its decline, uh, ethnic nationalism, um, which, given how diverse the Ottoman Empire was, actually uh, sowed division and led to unrest. And then it actually in earned the nickname during this time as the sick man of Europe. Uh, Europeans, uh, especially uh, Russians, saw opportunities to expand their own empires at the expense of a weakening Ottoman Empire. Um, though they feared the results of this um, power vacuum from um, just a total collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it ends up being dismantled after World War I. Uh, and then uh, Turkey enters the equation. Uh, China uh, you know, suffered really uh, two great uh, humiliations at the hands of Europeans in the 19th century. You had the Opium Wars, uh, which essentially um, um, opened up access uh, to uh, trade, uh, which China had been resisting because they didn't want the European influence and uh, the same scene to unfold that they had seen unfold in other Asian countries. And then you also had um, the... Um, uh, emergence of uh, or China being split into fears, spheres of influence, where basically the global industrial industrial powers uh, had this open trade approach uh, to China that really weakened its domestic industry and influence. And then in Japan, the central government grew stronger uh, as it struggled to maintain independence uh, and uh, really uh, cultural uh, its own cultural identity. 
and uh, and we'll look at the um, how Japan actively sought Western innovations um, that it would help make it the equal of Western countries while still um, while still maintaining its identity. So if we look at these if we look at these one by one, and the Ottomans, um, you know, one part of the Ottoman Empire where the Sultan uh, ruled in name only. Now, I didn't have much political power. It was in Egypt, and it was uh, out of Egypt. Uh, if you remember the Mamluks, uh, which were former Turkish slaves, uh, they had formed a military class, and they had essentially ruled there uh, for 600 years. In 1801, the Sultan sent an Ottoman army to retake Egypt, and in this conflict uh, with the Mamluks, an Albanian Ottoman officer by the name of Muhammad Ali rises to prominence. And local leaders selected him to be the new govern, governor of Egypt. And then he used this power uh, to essentially um, continue the independence that Egypt had from the sultan. He joined the sultan's military campaigns when it benefited him, even took campaigns without the sultan's permission, and started to reform Egypt, um, you know, uh, modeling its military in the European model, establishing schools sending military officers to be educated in France, starting even an official newspaper, the first uh, in the Islamic world. And then he taxed the peasants at a higher rate, and uh, they uh, were essentially forced to give up their lands to the state. Uh, and th in this way, the government could then control the cotton production in Egypt and make money on the export of cotton and other agricultural products. Uh, he also secularized the religious lands, um, which put more agricultural produce in the hands of the government and really resulted in large profits when, um, uh, during the period of the Napoleonic Wars, when the prices for, for wheat went really high in Europe, people turned to the Egyptian market. And uh, he had textile factories built. Um, he, uh, in, in Cairo, in Egypt, he had factories built to produce arms, weapons. Um, in Alexandria, he set up facilities to build ships so that Egypt could have its own uh, navy. So uh, certainly, um, you know, we have to be careful in history to ascribe to one man a lot of, or one person, uh, a lot of change or a lot of power. But uh, 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 Muhammad Ali really was um, is considered the first great modern ruler of Egypt, and partly because of this vision for state-sponsored industrialization. Now, we already talked about uh, China a little bit. We mentioned the Opium Wars, and, and essentially, uh, China, uh, the opening of China represents a, a, a what becomes known as China's century of humiliation, right? Where once being the center at, of the of global commerce and trade and attention and the shift to western industrialization and the global economy focusing on the west really led to china's decline during this time in japan between 1600 and 1854 they had little contact with the rest of the world um, however the imperial powers that were rising at the time did not want to let japan keep to itself so they all wanted to sell goods to Japan. They all wanted to open up its markets. Um, you know, in the age of coal-powered ships, trading states wanted to be able to refuel in Japan as they sailed to and from China. We talked about those way stations. So in 1853, a naval squad led by Commodore Matthew Perry in, uh, um, sailed into uh, Yedo and Tokyo Bay asking for trade privileges. Uh, the next year, uh, Perry, uh, who was um, a Commodore for the United States, returned with even more ships, uh, demanding that the Japanese engage in trade with the United States. So uh, faced with the power of U.S. warships, uh, the Japanese gave in to the U.S. demands. And soon what would follow was yielding to demands from other states, right? Because other nation states weren't going to let the United States have Japan all to themselves. So the arrival of uh, Perry, though, and the threat that he posed caused Japanese leaders to realize really uh, the danger that they and Japanese culture faced if they opened themselves up to the rest of the world. 
right? They had seen what had happened in China. China had been humiliated by the West. They watched, uh, you know, what happened unfolded in the Opium Wars. They watched what happened in India. So while some Japanese argue that the country could uh, defend itself um, and that everything would be fine and that they could benefit from the economic advantages of trade, others thought that that was not the case. So they said, no, the country, Japan, should adopt just enough Western technology and methods to protect its traditional culture. And so to accomplish this goal, they overthrew the shogun and restored power to the emperor in 1868. And this is an event that is known as the Meiji Restoration. So Japan systematically visited Europe and the United States. They invited experts to Japan, and they studied Western institutions and industrialization, and then they adopted reforms based on what it admired about those areas. It abolished feudalism in uh, 1868 in something called the Charter Oath. It established a constitutional monarchy uh, modeled really after uh, Prussia, uh, where the uh, emperor ruled through a subordinate political leader. Uh, it established equality before the law. It abolished cruel punishments. Uh, it reorganized the military, again, modeled after the Prussian army, uh, built a new navy, uh, started a draft, created a new school system and expanded education, uh, invested in railroads and roads. And then uh, the government uh, funded industrialization in uh, industries like tea, silk, uh, shipbuilding, weaponry, and um, uh, rice wine. So the government financed all these reforms with a high agricultural tax, and the taxes proved a good investment because they stimulated this rapid economic growth. And it provided uh, revenue for this uh, new uh, bureaucracy that was now centered in Tokyo. Now, at the same time as they replicated some of these Western models, they also repeated um, some of the problems that we saw in industrial society. So, you know, you had abuse and exploitation of female uh, workers in factories and mills. Uh, you had, um, you know, concerns about inequality and, uh, of, of course, the environmental consequences uh, and impact as well. So economic developments, what were some of the economic uh, innovations that were happening during this time? Uh, new ways of organizing businesses arose out of the Industrial Revolution. Some manufacturers formed giant corporations in order to uh, minimize risk. Uh, basically, a corporation um, is a more flexible structure, right? Instead, instead of having this traditional system where a single entrepreneur, a single investor, uh, engages in high-risk endeavors, uh, the uh, corporation allows for a collective risk sharing, similar to the joint stock uh, companies uh, that we talked about in the previous unit. Um, the, um, you had some corporations that become so powerful that they could form a monopoly. Um, you know, control of specific business and the elimination of all competition, right? That's the goal of the board game monopoly. That's what an actual monopoly is. Um, uh, we've mentioned the Bessemer process was still, uh, that allowed for um, uh, John D. Rockefeller to create a, uh, um, or I'm sorry, Andrew Carnegie to create a um, monopoly on steel in the, uh, in the United States. Rockefeller for his part had a monopoly on the oil industry in the United States. Uh, you also had companies working across borders, so you had the emergence of transnational companies made possible by the ease of, of communication uh, as well. And then, of course, um, you had banking and finance changes. Another way to reduce risk was through insurance, especially marine insurance. Uh, so Lloyd's of London, as an example, uh, began in a coffee house where merchants and sailors went uh, for, for shipping news and gossip. They established the, one of the earliest insurance industries. Uh, the notion that if you lost, uh, if you lost uh, goods or even a ship in a trading transaction, it could be you could pay for insurance. Um, the number of banks rose as merchants and entrepreneurs looked for a place to deposit money and the growing wealth they were accumulating, and then to borrow it to, to get loans whenever they needed capital to build a factory or hire workers or 
or what have you. And then, of course, you have the consumer culture, right? This uh, culture of consumerism, uh, as well as of leisure, uh, developed among the working and middle class. Uh, living standards rose for some. Consumption needed to keep up with production and vice versa. Uh, you had leisure activities like biking, boating that became popular during this time, right? People didn't have to spend all their time farming or focus, focusing on uh, subsistence. And in fact, some companies encouraged their workers to participate in athletics uh, because they thought that it instilled in things like self-discipline and playing by the rules uh, and this compliance that they would uh, emphasize in the factory system. So not everyone was happy uh, with the industrialization. So, uh, you know, you had dangerous and unsanitary working conditions, low wages, long hours in the factory. Um, you know, a, uh, a report that the British Parliament released in the early 1800s described some just deplorable conditions. You had the jungle in the United States uh, later uh, in the just in the early 1900s. And it made people realize that things weren't great. So workers uh, responded to this by forming labor, labor unions, which were organizations of workers that advocated for the right to bargain with employers uh, and put resulting agreements that they negotiated in a contract. So some of these at first had to organize in secret because many, uh, even the government, treated them as enemies of trade. And by the 20th century, they were more accept became more acceptable and they adopted, uh, fought for things like minimum wage, limits on uh, the work week, uh, overtime pay, uh, uh, work hours, uh, setting standards for work hours. And then they even spark movements for political rights, like voting rights, um, in the concerns with child labor and, and uh, things of that nature. You also have an intellectual response, right? Remember, we've not forgotten about the ideas of the Enlightenment. So as trade and production became global, the ideas of these early economists and philosophers that we talked about earlier um, spread along with the goods that were being traded. So uh, people started to think about society in new ways, right? We mentioned utopian socialists. Uh, some economists, uh, clergy, intellectuals criticize laissez-faire capitalism as inhumane to workers, and, and, and especially with some of the messages we saw coming from the labor unions. And one of these was a British philosopher by the name of John Stuart Mill. And he fought for or advocated for legal reforms that would allow labor unions, that would limit child, child labor, ensure safe working conditions, and uh, at the time, his ideas were very controversial, but now they're pretty much widely accepted. Um, but this philosophy was called utilitarianism. So rather than state a set of um, moral rules, uh, as many religions did or ethicists did, uh, utilitarians sought to uh, what, what he said was the greatest good for the greatest number of people, right? Uh, unlike utopian socialists, who just wanted to uproot and replace capitalism, um, Utilitarians wanted to address the problems with capitalism, right? They didn't want to do away with it completely. They just wanted to deal with its, the negative aspects of it. Uh, they considered themselves moderate, uh, and, and any reforms that they advocated, wanted, they wanted it to be gradual, not immediate. Um, now, while most reformers wanted to fix what they considered problems with capitalism, some reformers thought that capitalism itself was a problem, and that was Karl Marx. Um, Unlike utopian socialists, uh, which which Marx, who Marx uh, really criticized because he thought they wanted to escape the problems of capitalism rather than actually address them, he looked uh, or wanted to look at how the world actually operated, and this is approach that um, um, he called scientific socialism. Right. So in 1848, he and uh, Frederick Engels published a pamphlet uh, now called the Communist Manifesto that summarized their view and their critique of capitalism. Marx said that capitalism was an, ad, an, ad, an advance on feudalism. Remember, we talked about the dialectic model uh, because it did produce tremendous wealth. However, that wealth was not being shared uh, evenly. Right. There was this mass wealth inequality. So that we had this contradiction between wealth and poverty that occurred because capitalism at its core divided society into two basic classes, the proletariat, the working class, and then 
the bourgeoisie, the middle class and investors who owned the machineries and the factories where the proletariat worked. So Marx said that market competition drove the bourgeoisie to exploit the proletariat because it drove up profits. And the more profits you have, the greater this divide becomes. And because the bourgeoisie owned the means of production, like machines, factories, mines, land, they received most of the wealth produced. Proletariat, the only thing they controlled was labor, right? So Marx called upon the proletariat to recognize their shared interest as a class and take control of the means of production and share the wealth that, that they had participated in creating. For Marx, he believed that socialism would automatically replace capitalism, right? And it then would later be replaced by a final stage of economic development, communism, in which all class distinctions would end, okay? And remember, the key thing with Marx is this would be a natural evolution rather than an immediate, a violent revolution, right? And, and we have folks like Lenin in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia who takes what Marx is arguing and turns it around and says, well, that we need to bring about, we need to replace ca capitalism now and do so violently. Which then brings us to the Ottoman reorganization. Um, we talked about, you know, the Ottoman Empire was is no longer at its peak by the 19th century, the sick man of Europe. Um, but uh, it did maintain some economic power. And uh, Sultan Mahmud II uh, reformed the Ottoman system. In 1826, he abolished uh, Janissaries, right, which had opposed him. He developed a new artillery unit trained by Europeans, um, similar to what uh, Muhammad Ali did in uh, Egypt. Uh, he abolished the feudal system in uh, 1831. Um, military officers were no longer tax collectors. Um, instead, um, uh, tax collections went directly to the central government, which then paid military personnel. So it, it ensured their loyalty, right? It, it weakened the power of the military. Um, and this uh, also included building roads, setting up postal service, um, uh, the um, basically creating European style ministries or bureaucracies in government. And uh, this laid the groundwork for the reforms that came after him called the Tanzimat, which means uh, reorganization. Uh, so th these included things like rooting out corruption, uh, ex extending education, um, uh, which was secular, right? So no longer relying on the educated class of Muslim scholars. Um, you had uh, new legal codes, which included commercial codes, com commu uh, included a, a criminal code. It made it easier for foreigners to do business uh, in the empire. Uh, you also basically uh, had a declaration of equality for all men in education and government appointments and justice, regardless of religion or ethnicity. Um, so these, um, these reforms occurred uh, during a, a, a vast period of economic change, right? And, and after the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1850, prices for food and other crops declined in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, with, but with this global economy in place, uh, built partially on the flow of wealth into the Mediterranean from European uh, colonial expansion in the Americas, uh, Ottoman workers were increasingly paid in cash rather than in goods. So financial enterprises like banking increased. Um, and, uh, uh, these changes were occurring along with kind of this slow movement toward industrialization. Let's see here. Ah, China. So like other, uh, powers that we've talked about, China under the Qing dynasty did feel also feel pressure to modernize. Um, the major reform effort of the Industrial uh, Revolution of China is known as the Self-Strengthening Movement. It developed as a way for the government to face uh, the internal and external problems that China was facing, right? Government officials hoped to strengthen China in its competition with foreign powers by advancing military technology and readiness, and then by training Chinese artisans in the manufacture of items for shipyard uh, and shipyards and arsenals. So Britain and French advisors actually aided China in reform efforts because they thought they could benefit from a stronger China. 
uh, we ended up exporting it though, of course. A stable government capable of collecting revenue allowed China to repay debt, it allowed them to participate in trade. And then for the Chinese, their existence as an independent state dependent upon uh, fixing its economy, right? And as another step towards reform, the Chinese government set up its own diplomatic corps and a custom service to help collect taxes on imports and exports. Uh, the government strategy was to uh, really take some modern ideas and technology and make it work with Chinese tradition rather than really upend things. Um, demand for reform increased after China lost uh, to Japan in the Sino-Japanese War in 1895. Uh, people formed clubs uh, to call for uh, change. Um, and uh, one of the responses to this was the 100 days of reform. And these reforms included things uh, like um, the abolition of outdated um, civil service exams, the elimination of corruption, which is like what we saw in the Ottoman Empire, the establishment of Western style uh, industrial, uh, commercial, and even uh, medical um, systems. Uh, now, uh, the emperor, um, uh, the emperor's aunt and adopted mother, however, and the most powerful political figure in the country, the empress dowager Shi Shi, Shi Qi, was a conservative. And at first, she opposed the reforms, and she wanted to protect traditional social and governmental systems, right? In fact, she even imprisoned the emperor and immediately repealed all of these reforms. However, over time, um, uh, towards the end of her rule, she came to recognize the problems with the civil service system. Uh, it, it was designed according to Confucian ideas of respect of, for rank and hierarchy, as well as this value of civic participation and action. But the wealthy were, by this point, using the civil servants to get favors, right? Uh, revenue dropped off uh, for the government because of bribes and, and the corruption. And non-qualified people were purchasing civil service spots, right? The whole system was being undermined. And so um, she started to shift slowly uh, toward uh, adopting more reforms. And, and, and unlike Turkey or the Ottoman Empire, where Europeans had little to gain uh, from any type of reform, in China, Europeans had a lot to gain from change. So when reforms were met with... Uh, with uh, conservatism from the empress, uh, the 1900 Boxer Rebellion, which we'll talk about in unit, unit six, um, against foreign influence, uh, you know, the, the Chinese government, including its provincial governors, continued to modernize, and some, often with the help of, of European and American advisors. So weakened by internal rebellion, fearing encroachment from Japan, China basically had to accept territorial protection from Western powers uh, who, uh, of course, exploited this and demanded trading concessions. And this culminates in 1911 with China becoming a republic. Japan. So just as China uh, ended its long-serving, um, long-standing civil service uh, system, the Japanese ended the traditional system of how authority was administered in the, in the country. In 1871, Japan gave samurai a final lump sum payment and legally dissolved their positions. Uh, so they were no longer fighting men. Uh, they were no longer allowed to carry swords. Uh, the Bushido, which is their code of conduct, was now a personal matter. It wasn't about an official government law. And some samurai adjusted to the change by serving as gov the government as jinros or elder statesmen. Others, like those uh, from the provinces, uh, farther outreaching provinces resisted the change. And so they defended their right to dress and to uh, wear their hair in traditional ways, to carry their swords and to enjoy essentially a, essential autonomy from the centralized government that samurai had done for years. And the last battle between the samurai shogunate forces and those loyal to the emperor occurred in the 1870s and the samurai were uh, defeated. Let's see here. So what was going on in society uh, during this time? 
so you have urbanization, right? And, and you have wildly different um, living conditions. You have tenement apartment buildings where families were crowded into in shoddy conditions. You had urban uh, slums, which were areas of the city where low income people were forced to live. Uh, obviously, uh, poor sewage and sanitation increased the ecological, uh, negative ecological footprint of the city. You had the emergence of class structure, the emergence of a working class. Um, they um, um, lacked specialization. Of, uh, they lacked uh, complex specialization, right? Um, most of the work they were doing was rote work in the factories. Uh, in comparison to the artisans of earlier generations, they needed fewer skills. And so as a result, managers viewed them as easily replaceable. Uh, again, most enduring continuity in world history is patriarchy. And while some women do have access to uh, working in the factories, they um, um, they still are treated um, uh, essentially as second class citizens. Uh, in fact, factory owners preferred to hire women uh, because they could pay them half uh, for what they paid men. It was they were just a cheaper form of of labor. Um, you also have the environmental impact, right? The Industrial Revolution was powered by fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, natural gas. Uh, you had um, air pollution, you had smog, uh, smog smoke, and fog uh, from factories, led to deadly respiratory problems. Water became polluted, uh, you know, that allowed diseases to spread. Urbanization made it easier for diseases to spread as well. So what kind of continuities and changes do we see during this time period? Some of the continuities, the things that we've seen throughout this, uh, our studies here, you know, you have innovation and advances in uh, knowledge. Uh, this is going to be something that endures throughout world history. The innovations change as the technology changes, but there's always this motivation, right, to, to learn more, uh, to find new ways of doing the same thing. You have a shift in the global economy from the Middle East and Asia to the West. This is something we saw with um, European arrival in the Americas and the uh, emergence of the Colombian Exchange and the uh, a formation of maritime trading empires. So it's a trend that started in previous units is continuing the shift away from uh, the Middle East and Asia to the West. Uh, reliance on resources is a continuity. The types of resources will change, right? So now we'll have fossil fuels, but still the extraction of raw materials from colonized areas is going to be an important motivator for some of these empires. Likewise, you have wealth accumulation. Mercantilism and capitalism are similar in that you want to accumulate wealth. The way you do that, though, in each is a little bit different, and the role of the state is different in each. A uh, change is the wealth accumulation occurs in previous eras from the empire level. Wealth accumulation now is happening from the private level, the individual level, the corporate level. Uh, and of course, the most enduring pa uh, continuity is patriarchy. That even as women are finding new uh, roles in the factory system, uh, they're still treated as a less than class of people. Uh, changes that occurred, you have the production and consumption of goods, uh, the emergence of consumerism, right? This notion of we're moving away from the cottage industry to the factory system and to interchangeable parts, the assembly line. So a shift away from artisan class to a working class um, where labor is low skilled versus high skilled. All of that's a change. Again, the types of resources we're using that are seen as valuable. Now, coal and oil, because of the steam engine and the internal combustion engine, they become the main resources that some of these uh, countries are fighting uh, for. You have the shift to a capitalist economic system away from a, a mercantile economic system, where it's about uh, limited government involvement, about private wealth, private ownership of capital that spurs production and economic growth. And then, of course, uh, social structures where you have the emergence of a working class and eventually will lead to the emergence of a middle class. Uh, but at the same time, you have this growing wealth inequality uh, as a result of some of these economic practices. And then political reforms that we saw during some of the Atlantic uh, revolutions and even the European revolutions, where now uh, we're talking about expanding access to voting and end to slavery. We're talking about reforms like the utilitarians were fighting for in terms of uh, protections for workers and restrictions on child labor uh, and those kinds 
of efforts. So that is unit five uh, in a nutshell. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, but we have one more unit to go as we continue our review for the 2020 AP World History exam. Take care.